All right, special welcome to everybody who's tuning in tonight for another, what I consider, exciting EBFA webinar. Um, excited to have Dr. Perry Nicholson again joining us for our Discovering Differentials webinar series. If this is your first time tuning in on the EBFA webinars, how it works is we take approximately 30 minutes to go through the slides, and then you're able to ask questions at the end, which we will answer. And if you have any continuing um, questions after we finish, you can always email either myself or um, Dr. Perry. I'm sure he'll offer his email out if you want to learn more. And we archive all of the webinars. They are kept on the EBFA website which is ebfafitness.com. You can find the webinar link, and that has all of our archives. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, which is EBFA Fitness. So we are getting started, again, discovering differentials. We are, again, very excited to have Dr. Perry Nicholson. Welcome, Dr. Perry. Thank you very much, Doc. I'm very honored to be back. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Perry is a founder of Stop Chasing Pain. Uh, it's a great website. He's very wise in the way that he approaches movement dysfunction and pain. So I highly recommend that everybody checks out his website and his education that he offers both through podcasts, webinars, articles, etc. He has lots of exciting stuff, um, which is, can all be found on Stop Chasing Pain. So discovering differentials. Why I created this series is because I want to take a lot of the concepts that I learned going through medical school on when I approach a patient and when health and fitness professionals should approach their clients who present with pain and movement dysfunction. The goal is to find what is the cause, kind of the root cause of their dysfunction so that you can improve your results and actually eliminate that pain and that dysfunction. So the way that you need to do this is to have a powerful differential list in the back of your mind. You need to systematically go through each of these differentials through a process of elimination. Start with the simplest, okay, you rule it out, move on to the next possible cause for their pain and their dysfunction. Remember that you want to go through all systems, consider vascular, neurological, immunological, anything that could be causing your client or patient dysfunction and pain. So the way that we're going to do tonight is a little bit different than our first Discovering Differential webinar is that Dr. Perry is going to take some time and go through a case study or a case example, the way that he assesses some differentials that he has in the back of his mind, and then the way that he treats that patient. And then I will spend some time going through a similar case study. So, Doc, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Doc. Well, um, yes, I specialize in seeing chronic cases, difficult, hard to fix cases that most other healthcare professionals have already evaluated and, and taken a look at. So I naturally um, go in looking outside of where most people have already looked. So that's kind of the way I approach the body when I look at it. And I just assume 100% of the time that somebody has a movement dysfunction that was a cause of where their pain is. Um, they just don't know it or they don't know where it is because most people have been too wrapped up in treating the side of pain as opposed to the source of pain. So in my practice, we treat both. So this is kind of a, uh, a way that you can see in how I clinically look at a patient. And when you start to look at people this way, it really uh, kind of puts the excitement back into practice again. So I, I'm going to go over one of the cases that was dear to me. It was a 35-year-old, um, very active female who uh, was chronic right-sided iliotibial band and tensile a lot of pain, and she was a runner. Um, and runners love to love, love to run. They just want to keep doing it, and she could not. And so it was an emotional release for her. So you know she was getting stressed because she couldn't do what she loved to do, and she tried some traditional therapy and massage, chiropractic, medications, even resting, and it felt good for a little while, but it always kept returning. So that's the first hint right then and there that if you do anything in your arsenal to try to help someone get well and it just doesn't stick, then you need to expand out your toolbox and look in other places. And that's going to kind of give you a system to look at here. So the prior history for her, um, she had given childbirth to her first child about five years ago. 
and she told me that it was a difficult birth. So I knew there was some pelvic floor trauma and some SI joint instability. So you know, I kept that in mind with what I'm going to look for during my evaluation. And she sprained her um, left ankle 10 years ago. Anytime there's a ankle injury or foot injury, no matter how long ago, it really sends flags up for me, and I'm sure the doc will agree with that. And she yeah. had lower back pain and sciatica during her pregnancy uh, to the last part of it, and it pretty much never went away, but it was kind of kept uh, maybe under the wire for pain with some regular chiropractic treatment, but never really truly went away. So um, one of the things that TFL and ITB band syndrome, it's a great uh, condition that mimics other things, and it's a tough condition to get rid of, and a lot of people suffer from it. And it's usually uh, indicated with pain in the lateral hip and thigh, usually right around into the groin sometimes, and referred pain to the knee a lot. So people can get patellar pain, uh, pain on the uh, lateral side of the knee, some, sometimes maybe known as runner's knee. I see it a lot. It mimics bursitis. So a ton of people I know have gone through uh, treatments for bursitis and not really had any success and uh, gotten cortisone injections and all sorts of things like that. But my mindset for TFL and ITB band syndrome is that that's just the name of a syndrome. That is not an official diagnosis, in my opinion. A diagnosis means that you found out what's causing it. So you have to assume there's a microtraumatic onset. Very rarely, if ever, is a TFL or ITB band injured from direct impact, maybe in, on the field or something. But very rarely does that happen. Most people say, I don't know, it just came out of nowhere. Automatically, you should know there's a movement dysfunction somewhere. There's inefficient movement. And it doesn't always have to happen on the side where everything hurts. And my my kind of benchmark is that if you do interventions on the painful side, even when you branch out to other areas, then you need to jump over and look at the other side. So just flip the coin over and look and nine times out of 10. When you do something on the other side of the body, you're going to find that underlying cause. Doc, you can flip the slide for me. Okay, so the biggest thing is uh, you need to treat a person, not a condition. What I mean by that is that you're never going to cookie cutter care. Nobody should get the same kind of program uh, for pain. So if I have patient A who comes in with TFL or ITB bit syndrome, it doesn't mean that I'm going to go to my file box and pull out the sheet for exercises for TFL and ITB band. Can't do that. There's so many things that are going to go into and contribute to a uh, condition. So part of the differentials that you need right off the bat is to take a, an adequate intake history and examination. So this is a great um, graphic that Diane Lee, who uh, I follow a lot, she gives some great stuff on the pelvis, is that you have to, and, and Doc said it before when she was going over differentials, you have to look for articular dysfunctions, neural, even visceral, internal organ referral pain or how their system is working to be able from the gut to hormones to everything to myofascial but some of the biggest ones are what's in the middle, their individual story of what's happened in their life until they walked into your door and what therapies they've tried. Because to me, the therapies that you've tried and has not worked tells me a lot about the ones that are going to work. So the last thing I'm going to do is what everybody else has done. So you have to look at how they view pain, how they view stress, and that it brings in the kind of uh, connection for their brain to body. Sometimes they have fear of movement and they're programmed to move dysfunctionally. The brain's going to always move you and try to protect you and it's going to take the path of least resistance to do that. So you need to keep that in mind when you're doing your evaluation. You can change the slide. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. So one of the things that I always do, I, I just do some very basic tests and the single leg squat is, is in single leg stance is one of my favorite all-time movements. I like to see well, what's happening on one side of the body compared to the other side. So I'm just going to have the client stand up and show me what you can do on the painful side, so on the painful ITBB side, and then do a little bit of a reach out so I can see what your control is when I challenge you with a little bit more uh, stability requirement. And then I'm going to have you do the other side. And I'll tell you, most of the time I'm going to see on the side that there's pain. They'll hold that thing like it's in cement. They won't move but they'll be a disaster on the opposite side. And that tells me right then and there that the painful side is usually the one side that's compensating and making up for the other side that does not function well. So the pain is just there because they're tired. It's tired of, of doing its job. 
So this is one of the best assessments you're ever going to do. So what I, uh, you can flip the slide for me now. Um, one of the things that you're going to look for in conjunction with that in a moment I get into is the overhead squat test. If I had to do one test in my office and I could only do one test on any client ever, this is the one I would do. This shows me right out of the gate what I'm dealing with. And it's kind of like an eye chart. If I put you in and I see, can you see the big giant E? And you tell me that you, you can't even see that. Uh, well, then I know that there's a problem with your vision. Okay, so this is basically the vision chart. So I'm going to put you in an overhead squat test and see what your body does with it. Can you control it? Can you move? Can you even figure it out? Do you lean? Do you twist? I mean, I can do a whole presentation just the overhead squat test, but those two tests will tell you a lot about what you want to look for in ITB band syndrome. You can flip the switch there. Down. Half kneeling chop and lift is my third favorite assessment. So this one is in a half kneeling position. And you'll have the forward foot, which is cut off on here. I apologize, down in line with the <clears throat> downward knee. And that's going to give me an idea of can they control the hip? Can they control stability? And then I'll, I'll give them a stick in front at a 45 degree angle about. And then I'm going to just move the stick, kind of see can they control um, perturbation? Can the reactive core, reflexive core kick in? And what you'll find is there'll be an asymmetry where they cannot control outside forces coming on in when they don't know what's happening. So then I know. They're dealing with a, a cross-body core problem in relationship to hip stability. And you want to always check the hip on both sides when you're dealing with a TFL or ITB band syndrome. <clears throat> Fantastic test. And, man, it can really send the bells off to clients. So the intervention that I did in here is that uh, for this client that I had seen, um, she actually had a problem on supination on the opposite side foot. So I know that she was leaning <clears throat> to her symptomatic side. and I just go through the kinetic chain <clears throat> looking at the fiber orientation and what I found for her is that she had a, a facilitated fibularis muscles, it used to be called the peroneals, which I still like to call them, um, and a facilitated opposite quadratus lumborum and an inhibited psoas on the same side. So basically what was happening is that she was getting too much, too much work down on the um, fibularis and she actually had an inhibited and weak TFL on the same side. So people were stretching and doing trigger point release on her TFL that was symptomatic, but that was making her worse because it was already weak and inhibited. So all I did was go down and release the fibularis and the opposite QL. And uh, then I got some strengthening into the psoas on the same side and the TFL. And what that did was, you can flip the, flip the slide down, it just it kicked in the neural sequencing, so I know when she moves, everything is moving when it's supposed to, because if she's doing that act of walking or running, if there's a muscle that's offline and it's not going at the right time, then the body's going to say, okay, well, you want to run, you want to do this, and you know your TFL is not working, then I'm just going to make everything else work twice as hard. So what happens is that you just get, you fall into this dysfunctional pattern that you don't even know it's there. Um, until you do these tests and then you can become aware and they can become aware. So they go from subconscious dysfunction to conscious dysfunction. They're like, wow, I didn't realize I was that messed up. And then boom, that's the switch where you go. So I fixed her by getting her into rolling patterns. I'm a big believer in neurodevelopmental patterning. patterning. So I regress back to get them on the ground and, and make sure that she can sequence just a basic pattern of rolling over. And this is a great way to involve that anterior chain so I know that she's going to be pulling from where she needs to as opposed to where she's been pulling from, which is incorrect. So if I get her down on the ground and she can't do this basic pattern on the top left, then I know she can't control her body when she's standing up. So a rolling pattern is a fantastic assessment and also a fantastic rehabilitation both combined together. You can flip the slide back. I got one more after this. So, sure. there, yeah, no, so, I didn't see one more. Yeah. Okay, that was it. Um, but yeah, to, to wrap it up about this this client is the one thing that I tell uh, people when they're doing differentials is um, just to automatically assume there is one and look at where it hurts, but look on the opposite side of the body first. I and mean, that's one of the biggest keys that I give to people and see how that's contributing to it. And then whatever intervention you take, Next time you see the client, you should notice a, a significant improvement in intensity, frequency, or duration of pain. Or that just means you got to change your approach. Or I kind of jokingly say you got punked by pain. Pain is faking you out. And you have to take that into consideration that pain is telling you something's wrong, but it's not telling you what 
is actually causing the pain. Oh, great. Doc, I think that was um, a great presentation and example on how, how, like you said, you should look on the opposite side of where the pain is. Um, you know how you had said it in the single leg squat, the side that they have the pain is actually more stable than the opposite leg, which is where the dysfunction is. I think that mm -hmm. that's um, a great point and how you don't use kind of a templated um, treatment approach with every, um, you know, TFL pain or, you know, it's not like you take out a sheet and you hand it to the, the client or the patient and they, they take it home. Um, I think that that's a, a common thing that you see in, especially in podiatry, is you just get these templated workouts and exercises mm -hmm. and you give them to the patients for plantar fasciitis. Here's my plantar fasciitis um, protocol. And um, it just shows that no condition is the same with every single patient. Um, so I think that's a great point that you make. Thank you. Yeah, I find that, you know, uh, every day in practice is, uh, it really comes down to the individual. The time you start to cookie cutter things and make assumptions is when you're going to get lost. And uh, the patient deserves better than that. Exactly. Um, so before I go into my case study, you had said that you you will release your this patient's, I'm going to call them perineals. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you call them you. Yeah. I like <laughs> and, to call them um, that too. Right. Can you can you tell everybody who's listening how you do that, or just sure. kind of like a quick little rundown, just so they can um, explore that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm whatever manual therapy you feel comfortable with is really the key. So I do a lot of stuff by hand, but I, I would actually release that facilitated muscle. I do some deep tissue laser therapy. So I do that first, but then I get in there and do some good old fashioned. Um, myofascial stripping and acupressure and whatever you choose to use is okay it's whatever you feel comfortable with but the key to it is that once you release that you have to actually find well what's inhibited in relationship to that I mean why is your body hanging on the peroneals I mean what's it doing that for so if you my point is that if you go in there and you do soft tissue interventions and they can be great but if you do soft tissue interventions and you always have to do the same intervention well you're on the wrong thing you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're getting punked by where that is coming back from. So if I made an intervention on the peroneals, I have to say, okay, well, if it's on that lateral chain, if the TFL and ITB band are not functioning properly, then your body is going to hang on the peroneals. So what you have to do is release the peroneals, then you have to immediately engage the TFL and ITB band and turn it on so you can actually communicate more of a talk it's like a software problem so your brain says okay well now I know I've got an ITB band and TFL that I can use when I need to so I'm gonna let the peroneals off the hook for a little while so you have to understand why you're doing what you're doing and, and follow it up so I don't even like people just chasing pain or spasm you always have to ask why okay well if I have this here why do I have it there and that's to get behind that type of approach Okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you for presenting that. Um, all right, so I'm going to move into my case, and um, we'll end with, with this case. And this is something that I see a lot in my office, which is, I'm a podiatrist, so patients are presenting to me with an initial complaint of their feet, and it usually often is associated with other um, movement dysfunctions. So um, I'm presented with a 40-year-old male who complains of bilateral foot pain and SI joint pain. So he feels like his feet and legs fatigue easily, his pain along the inside of his right ankle, and the patient has pain on ambulation, particularly on the SI joint right side, chronic pain fatigue that has led to increased um, inactivity and weight gain. So when I'm assessing this client and I get kind of a generalized foot fatigue, low back pain, I always do a full um, open chain, closed chain, and functional assessment with every patient. On open chain, when I assess the patient, I see limited ankle joint range of motion, both feet. He has a mild bunion or shift in the great toe on both feet, but what I notice is that he has very good range of motion in that big toe. So that's, that's important to note that he has good range of motion, non-weight bearing in both of his great toe. 
The muscle strength, 5 out of 5, or it's normal, but he has decreased activation in the gluteus medius and gluteus maximus isometrically when I do a muscle test. It's a positive Thomas test, which is indicative of the tight hip flexors. I stand him up, closed chain assessment, resting foot position. This is what you see. Um, you can clearly see that his left foot is pronating, so something, something's going on in that left foot. And then he has increased calcaneal eversion, abduction. All of these fall into under that pronation. And he has an anterior pelvis tilt on the left side. And he has rotation on that left side as well, so that's important to note as well. Functionally, we have him do a double, double leg overhead squat. You notice he has an increased lumbar extension, which would go with the positive Thomas test that we did. He has a slight valgus rotation in the knees, which would go with the pronation that we saw. And then when I ask him to walk and I do my typical gait assessment, I notice that he has very little hip extension when he walks, which means that he's going to activate his hip flexors early. He's actually apropulsive, and he loses all of his dorsiflexion in his big toe on his left foot when he walks. So open chain, he had great range of motion in his big toe, and then when he starts walking, he loses all of that range of motion, so something is going on in that big toe. And because he has that lack of range of motion, he now has lost his hip extension when he walks. So what is going to limit hip extension when we walk, and what is the sequelae of limited hip extension? So to walk in a normal sagittal range of motion, you need adequate anterior hip mobility. So if he has a positive Thomas test, tight overactive hip flexors, he's going to have a reduction in hip extension. If he cannot get adequate hip extension, he is going to pull his leg into propulsion or a hip flexion much faster. What can also limit that hip extension that we see in this patient is that on open chain, I noticed he did not have good ankle joint range of motion. Maybe that's causing the cause of his limited hip extension. And then open chain, he had this great range of motion in his big toe. As soon as he starts walking, he loses all of that range of motion. If you can't get over your big toe, there's no way that you can extend your hip back. So in this patient, is it the lack of anterior hip mobility that's causing his limited hip extension? Is it the limited ankle mobility? Or is it the limited great toe mobility? So considerations for this patient. When you see somebody like this, and I encourage fitness professionals and um, health and wellness professionals, whenever they see a client or patient with low back pain, underactive glutes, they've got to go down to the foot. You have to look at more than just the ankle, you have to look at the big toe. So if you think of sagittal gait, our ankle and our big toe is what's going to control that sagittal hip extension when we walk. So considerations for this patient, he has an overpronated foot type, he has a knee valgus, and he had a collapse indicating the weak external rotators. The range of motion in this great toe, um, was great non-weight bearing. As soon as he started walking, he lost all of that motion in that great toe. So it's blocked, which means he cannot get adequate hip extension. Compensation for this limited great toe mobility is a propulsion. You become a propulsive. That means you're going to over-recruit your hip flexors. You over-recruit your hip flexors, and your glutes start shutting off. If you start shutting off your gluteus maximus, this is the primary muscle that stabilizes your SI joint, and now we have the common SI joint dysfunction. So in this patient, and when you see um, a client or a patient that presents similar to this, you want to ask yourself, is the SI joint dysfunction associated with this patient's lack of hip extension? And if it is, is the cause of this lack of hip extension because he has limited great toe mobility. And if it is, what is the most effective way to fix the great toe hypomobility? So where, where do you start with this patient? Do you go straight to the glutes, try and activate the glutes, try and mobilize the hip, get more hip extension? But if you do not address that great toe, you're going to keep going right back to where you were, and I consider it the hands are going around in the wheel. 
So what we are talking about here is called functional helix limitus. So this means that that patient and that client had great range of motion in the big toe when he was open chain, loses that range of motion when he walks. The key word when you think of this dysfunction is the word functional. Functional typically means when you're moving, it's associated with muscle imbalances. In the foot, in this dysfunction, what is the muscle imbalance that we're thinking of? Muscle imbalance that we're thinking about, it has to do with the first ray. If you've never um, studied and kind of delved into the foot mechanics, the first ray is what's formed by the gray toe, the first metatarsal, the medial cumiform. So it's pretty much the, the whole inside aspect of your foot. And your first ray actually has its own axis. So it can dorsiflex and invert and plantar flex and evert. Becomes very complex, but what's important to know is that your first ray will dictate how much range of motion you have in your big toe. And you must stabilize your first ray by two different muscles. One is a supinator and one is a pronator. On top of your first metatarsal, you have your tibialis anterior. On the bottom, you have your peroneus longus. You have a supinator, which is the tibialis anterior, and you have a pronator, which is the peroneus longus. What dysfunction leads to this imbalance between the supinator and the pronator is pronation. Everything can be blamed on pronation. <laughs> so left foot pronating, that's what they taught us in school. Anything, what's the cause? Pronation. So here he is over pronating on that left foot. Is this the cause of this imbalance between his tibial center and his pronus longus? A lot of the research and the theory says yes. And the reason is that when you pronate and your rear foot collapses, you change the lever arm of your pronus longus, which means that it cannot stabilize that first ray. If you cannot stabilize that first ray, your big toe cannot get over the first metatarsal. That means you are going to lose all of that range of motion when you start walking and you bear weight. So for this patient, and I see this actually a lot in my office, is if I approach this patient, one, I can give them a great pair of orthotics, or two, I like to use corrective exercise and more of a movement therapy approach, is you cannot approach that SI joint dysfunction without first correcting that functional hallux limitus. You cannot correct that functional hallux limitus without correcting the overpronation. And you cannot correct your foot overpronation without addressing your hip, specifically your hip external rotators. So our intervention for this patient that's presenting with SI joint dysfunction, starting with the foot and the hip, and then start stabilizing the SI joint. First, you must mobilize, and then we're going to activate. So you have to mobilize your hip, mobilize your ankle. When you mobilize your ankle, I've done several other webinars on ankle hypermobility. You always want to find out, is it the gastroc? Is it the soleus that's tight? Does the patient or client possibly have a bony block or an anterior shift of their talus? So there's many causes for decreased ankle joint range of motion besides just tight calves. So keep that in the back of your mind as well and explore other ways that you can increase ankle mobility. Increasing range of motion of the hips so that they can get adequate hip extension. Once you mobilize, I always activate my patient's muscle. So the muscle that I'm trying to strengthen, you must first activate after you mobilize. So we're going to activate the foot inverters, which is your posterior tibialis and your soleus muscle. And then we're going to activate the hip external rotators, which will be your gluteus maximus and your gluteus medius. Once you activate those muscles, I do both concentric and eccentric strengthening with my patients and with my clients. Why I do both phases is this is how we use our muscles. Every single time you take a step, your body is going from an eccentric to a concentric contraction. So you need to train both of those phases. And you need to train the timing of those phases and the conversion from one phase to the other phase. So again, the next time that you see a client or a patient who has SI joint pain or SI joint instability, I advise you and encourage you to look at the ankle and look at the great toe. 
watch them walk, look how much hip extension they have. If they do not have an adequate amount of hip extension, try to look more um, distally towards the ankle and the foot, see if their anterior hip is restricting them, see if their glute max is not firing. If you do see that the glute max is not firing, you then have to explore some of the more um, differentials on why the glute max does not fire. So, if you have any questions, you can ask them for either Dr. Perry or myself. If not, I encourage you to check out some of the other EBFA webinars, which are archived. And we have some exciting workshops that are coming up in September. And we have our online education portal, which is full of research articles. And um, Dr. Perry, I didn't put your website on there, but it's stopchasingpain.com. Yep. And I don't know if you want to put them anywhere else. Talk. You know, that'll pretty much launch it to everything I've got online. So if you type that in, all my other links are at the top, and then you can spider out from there. So that's home base. And you can email me from that website as well. Okay, great. If you guys want a copy of the webinar, or... Uh, we record all of the webinars if you want a link to that as well. You can email me at education at ebfafitness.com. Again, that's education at ebfafitness.com. Or you can, again, catch them on the website. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We have a new blog coming out. Um, my next blog article I'm very passionate about because this is my injury. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about athletic pubalgia, which is a groin injury that's common in high, um, high performance athletes such as hockey and soccer, but there's common dysfunctions that lead to this. So um, I'm trying to increase the awareness of this injury just because I went through many loopholes to finally get to the right um, diagnosis. So any last words, Doc Perry? Yeah, actually, I just wanted to follow up to say how much I enjoyed your case review and that um, I really love how you implement the activation and corrective movements in with a client, even when you give them supportive orthotics. I mean, too, too many times in my office, people do come in to see me and they have orthotics and they were just given to them by, could be anyone, but that was all they did and it's, it's almost like they think it's a magic fix but and to me it's like a crutch that wearing a support belt for your back that you're just asking your muscles to not even work even more and they can't own that that new positioning of the foot so that is uh, really wonderful to see that you're doing that with your clients and I'm sure that they get some positive results with that. Thank you. Yeah the um, your orthotics, I'll just speak about this briefly, is the orthotics do get um, kind of a bad reputation, especially in um, kind of the movement industry and fitness. I, a lot of people are anti-orthotic. I like them in the cases of um, they'll maintain proper joint alignment, which is great. So if I have a patient who's in pain, I like the orthotics for managing and kind of restricting the mobility so then the tissue can recover. And then I get all of my patients and clients out of their orthotics to then strengthen and try and establish that, that normal motor firing pattern. So, you know, some people do need the orthotics, so they're not all that bad. But um, I do try and create that balance between movement and um, a support brace like an orthotic. Yeah, and, you know, I got to say one of the other reasons why I like you so much is because you hit it right on the head with the big toe. I, when people see me, um, that's one of the first places I look um, for them, even if it's something all the way up in their head. So, you know, I explain to them of, of why I'm looking down there. And I want to say that nine times out of ten, if I suspect that's a culprit, I usually find it because most people are not keyed in to look there. So what you guys learned today about focusing on that big toe that is a huge clinical pearl that you really don't pick up until you've been out in the trenches for a while and you see it in action. So that's wonderful advice there, Doc. Thank you. And yeah, assessing in both open chain and, and closed chain, or non-weight bearing and weight bearing, huge. And um, there's some great articles. I have it on that online portal. Is like a 10-page 
review on the first ray, which again is not spoken about much, but biomechanically to understand the first ray will really solidify the understanding of the great toe. So um, I encourage everybody to check out and read a little bit more on the first ray or um, I'll do a webinar <laughs> on the first ray. We can explore it together. Yeah, or hit one of your awesome workshops. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Great. So thank you guys so much. And um, again, thank you, Dr. Perry. You guys will be seeing Dr. Perry again, I'm sure, on another future EBFA webinar. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. The organizer has 